Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Global Health Debate of CUGH 2024. I'm Tom Quinn, Johns Hopkins University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very entertaining, educational debate on a very timely topic that uh, we really need to address. I have certain rules that, that this debate follows. Um, I mentioned uh, just before, it's modeled after the Lincoln-Douglas debating. Uh, we have two esteemed colleagues who are experts in this field. Uh, they have elected to take one side of uh, the resolution and the other individual will take the other side. I will introduce them after we talk a little bit about the resolution that all of you will need to vote on. Before we start, and then we will vote on it again at the end of the debate to see if our debaters could sway your opinion on this particular topic. So it's on artificial intelligence in global health. I attended last year's CUGH meeting in Washington, D.C., and I really do not recall AI even being mentioned in that meeting. Whereas this year, just about every session I attended, I don't know about all of you, but at least from my own personal perspective, AI was brought up in one way or another, either its positive side or perhaps a negative side. And so the Executive Planning Committee, recognizing the growth of AI, and whether it can be harnessed in a beneficial way or whether it could serve in a detrimental way, really felt that this was a topic that we needed to learn more about. And what other way can you really learn both sides of the fence but to have an open, lively debate? And so the Executive Planning Committee came up with the resolution. And I'm going to read the resolution to you. Think about it for just 30 seconds uh, to a minute. Uh, and then I want to see a show of hands as to whether you support this resolution or you think it went too far and you disagree. So the resolution is artificial intelligence, or AI, is a threat to global health. It is a threat to global health. All right, that is the resolution. How many of you agree with that resolution? Show your hands. It is tough with these bright lights. Okay, for those who are against the resolution, really feel it went way too far, raise your hands. My goodness. Okay. So our two esteemed colleagues now see what they need to do to convince one side versus the other. All right, we are very fortunate to have really two outstanding individuals that uh, know this field and, and can actively engage us uh, in the topic. Let me start first with the individual who is going to argue in favor of that resolution. That's Abraham Flexman, who's an associate professor of health metric sciences and global health at the University of Washington. AB uh, leads the simulation science research at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, where he's developed a simulation platform to derive the quote, what if results from the global burden of disease estimates, which we have discussed at every meeting. He's also working on methodologic operational research on verbal autopsies, uh, has designed software tools uh, that, use, uh, that are used to estimate the global burden of disease. Dr. Flaxman earned his bachelor's in mathematics from MIT and his PhD uh, from Carnegie Mellon in 2006. So he will argue for that resolution 
that it is a threat to global health, even though he uses artificial intelligence every day. <laughs> All right, Dr. Steph Bertozzi, good friend and colleague, it's a pleasure to see you again. He's former Dean and Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. Previously, he directed the HIV tuberculosis program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He worked at the Mexican National Institute of Public Health as director of its Center for Evaluation, Research, and Surveys and he was the last director of the WHO Global Program on AIDS and has held positions with UNAIDS, the World Bank, uh, and the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Currently serves on the governance and advisory boards of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, the Global Viral Network, the Institute of Transformative Technologies, et cetera, et cetera, and many other organizations. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and holds his bachelor's degree in biology and his doctorate degree in health policy and management from none other than MIT. So we have two alumni from MIT that are gonna argue this uh, statement. Uh, so uh, without further ado, please welcome first to argue for the resolution, Dr. Abraham Flexman. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you everyone. It was so exciting to see where you lie on the uh, perspective on that resolution. I definitely did not know what to expect. I'm gonna press this button and see if it brings up a slide. Ah, it did, and now it's where I can see it too. So how can we organize the multitude of threats to artificial intelligence in global health in just five minutes? First, I wanna have a shared understanding of what is artificial intelligence. This particular term is about to turn 70 years old, and it was first used in a research proposal to create a machine capable of simulating every aspect of learning and any other feature of human intelligence. But it is the breakthroughs in the last two years in what has come to be called generative AI that has got me really paying attention. Gen AI includes chatbots like ChatGPT and other systems that output text and images and really any kind of media. And in the last month, four new chatbots have come out that compare favorably to ChatGPT. And OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, uh, demoed a system that generates video from text prompts so well, this is one of their examples, it worked so well that filmmaker Tyler Perry immediately canceled the $800 million expansion of his Atlanta movie studio. So this is amazing, this is amazing stuff. This is scary stuff. And here's how I organize the threats for you. At the top is something we might call existential risk of super intelligence. The companies leading these gen AI breakthroughs are dreaming of completing the original vision of AI by creating a machine that simulates every aspect of human intelligence. And some theorize that there's no reason for a machine to stop advancing when it reaches the level of human intelligence. So thinking about this sort of super intelligence turns very quickly into a compelling plot for science fiction. But what if super intelligent AI emerges? What if it has interests that are incompatible with human flourishing? I actually was not too concerned with this sort of X risk before I started preparing for this debate. But now, well, I'm just glad that some people are taking it seriously. Um, but there's a catastrophic threat from AI that seems even closer, which we can think of as intentional misuses by bad actors. And so first of all, I'm thinking of things like bioterrorism, things where an AI-enhanced uh, scientific capability enables destruction way beyond the scale of that perpetrated by state or even uh, non-state or even state actors. And more focused misuse is already happening, uh, like misinformation campaigns that use AI to generate content to influence politics. We've seen how politically polarizing global health interventions like vaccines can be, uh, and now AI offers powerful new tools to actors working to, for example, undermine vaccine confidence. 
In the same vein, I'm also very concerned about sexual harassment and bullying that is enabled by AI-generated pornography. If you haven't seen this, disgusting and real. It's deep fake technology, is kind of the term of art. And it can produce these disturbingly realistic pornographic materials, which look like they really feature the target of the sexual harassment. Even if we mitigate threats by these bad actors, I'm still concerned about threats of unintended consequences, maybe even more concerned. Uh, for example, AI may automate many tasks, displacing jobs, changing the nature of work. And while this could have implications across society, in global health specifically, as AI takes on more routine tasks, our students could have fewer opportunities to develop expertise through practice, uh, leading to what you could think of as a sort of apprentice gap, uh, preventing their progression from novice level to expert level skills. I hope to elaborate on some more of these unattended consequences um, as we continue this debate, but I want to wrap up this opening statement by calling your attention to a threat that I think might be the biggest, uh, which you could call AI bias. Machine learning is basically identifying patterns in existing data, and that means it recapitulates any biases that are present in the data used to train the system. So I've thrown a lot at you very quickly, and I want to close by playing you what is sort of a poetic interrogation of a striking example of this kind of AI bias. And it comes from an AI for recognizing faces. Facial, facial recognition software uh, was trained on faces from the internet. And the majority of the photos that were used in this training were photos of white men. Uh, and in fact, in one training instance, only 5% of the training photos were of black women. And until Dr. Joy Bulamwini, also an MIT alum, an author of this poem that I'm going to play, uh, pointed it out, researchers thought they were doing pretty well in facial recognition. And with a data set like that, you can be 95% accurate and also be wrong for every black woman. as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. In this case of deja vu, a 19th century question comes into view. In a time when Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? Today, we pose this question to new powers, making bets on artificial intelligence, hope towers. The Amazonians peek through windows blocking deep blues as faces increment scars. Old burns, new urns, collecting data chronicling our past, often forgetting to deal with gender, race, and class. Again, I ask, ain't I a woman? Face by face, the answers seem uncertain. Young and old, proud icons are dismissed. Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers as we knew them? Ida B. Wells, data science pioneer, hanging facts, stacking stats on the lynching of humanity, teaching truths hidden in data, each entry and omission, a person worthy of respect. Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, the first black congresswoman, but not the first to be misunderstood by machines well-versed in data-driven mistakes. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Does relaxed hair and sunny skin make Oprah the first lady? Even for her face well-known, some algorithms fault her echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty.
Now we will hear from Dr. Pertossi on the attributes of AI. Thank you, Tom. That was um, very compelling. I'm, I'm convinced, Davey, and I think you've already won. <laughs> we could all just go home now. Um, unfortunately, Tom explained to me that people paid good money to watch an old white man yell at a younger white man, so I should just get up and do my job. I guess, I guess you haven't seen that movie before. So it's actually true. I wasn't kidding. I agree with A.B. that this stuff is scary, and we should worry about it. We should worry about it a lot. Remember that Facebook thought it was the saving the world, and its AI, well, how did that turn out? It gave us Trump, and it'll probably give us Trump back again. But today's discussion isn't about whether AI is going to be good for democracy, or whether it's going to be good for extremism, or whether it's going to be good for authors, or artists, or screenwriters. It's about whether it's good for global health. And I choose to believe, I choose to define that as being, is it going to reduce inequality globally in health? So if AI starts World War III, as A.B. has suggested, then yeah, it's right, it's going to be bad for global health. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that World War III is an unlikely outcome. And I'm also going to assume, and maybe you'll agree with me, that even if all of us global health folks can get all of our friends and we all wring our hands about how bad AI is, we're not going to stop it. It's unstoppable, and so we're going to have to live with it. And it turns out I'm inherently a techno-optimist. I may not have any expertise, but, <coughs> but I'm a fan. And why am I a fan? Well, I, I think back when I was a graduate student in Kinshasa and what was then Zaire, two remarkable things happened while I was there. Cell phones happened and the internet happened. So cell phones were pretty magical because suddenly you didn't need to be powerful enough to get somebody to bring copper wires to your house and that somebody could then remove. So if you had money, and progressively less and less money, you could have communications. And secondly, the internet happened. So before you had to get on a plane and fly to the Harvard Medical Library, suddenly in the Ministry of Health or in Mama Yimo Hospital, you could get on a computer and have full access to the Harvard Medical Library. Amazing. I mean, when I think about back you know, when I started collaborating with Rwanda, either I had to go to Kigali or Kigali had to come to me. Now I have a, Monday, a Tuesday morning meeting um, every week um, where we get together on Zoom. I teach students simultaneously in, in Berkeley and in Indonesia, and they work on projects together um, for their mutual benefit. So yeah, I'm primed to be a techno-optimist. So when I think about this AI, I ask myself the question, who is going to be differentially benefited by what's happening with AI. And AI, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the application of these large language models to health. So I think X-ray machines are a lot cheaper and a lot more prevalent than are highly trained radiologists. If I have a problem in my lungs, I can go to the hospital in San Francisco. My X-ray will be read within a matter of hours by a radiologist who probably, we probably spent $750,000 on his training or her training, and um, I'll get my answer in a couple of hours. But if I'm living in a small rural community, pretty much anywhere, including California, I won't have that access. And it would be really wonderful if the AI assistant could read that x-ray and tell my nurse provider that I either need to go be referred to a place that can diagnose and treat my tuberculosis or not. If I have diabetes, I worry about my retina. I could go into any pharmacy with a camera, stick my eye in the camera, and have it take a picture of my retina. That is cheap and easy. What's hard is finding the ophthalmologist who can interpret the picture of my retina. Well, if AI could tell the pharmacist that either I need to be referred or my eye looks good, that would be a huge help. So I went to medical school a long time ago. And many years ago, the EKG machine was already better than I was at figuring out whether the heart that it was looking at was starved of oxygen or not. I've also played with an ultrasound machine. Some of you probably have too. And um, it still looks to me like it's a cold front coming in off the coast of Sweden. So I'd, last year, the Gates Foundation, they introduced about 500 handheld ultrasound machines into rural Kenya. And I think they underestimated the training that was required to make those machines effectively used in that environment. So imagine how wonderful it would be if that little handheld ultrasound machine could talk to you and say, sweep left, sweep right, tilt up, tilt down and then up pops the answer that the gestational age of the fetus, 
for, whether it's twins or a singleton, or if you're pointing at the heart, what's the ejection fraction is, how well is this heart pumping blood? Now, the benefits of those advances will be greatest for those who don't currently have access to the high quality manual analog version that I have. And there are benefits even if AI is not better than the best providers, because that's not the relevant standard. The relevant standard is, is the AI better than the alternative for that person? Now, I'm no fan of Elon Musk, but I have to say I think he's right when he says that self-driving cars represent progress even if they sometimes kill people. What matters is whether they kill people less than people do when they're driving their cars, right? If they do, then they will save lives. So Bob Wachter is a colleague at UCSF. He recently published a piece about, about the use of GPT-4 when presented with signs and symptoms from a patient to come up with a list of diagnoses that were possible for that patient. And he says, well, he didn't say it this way, but it's not yet as good as he is. But it's pretty good. And so telemedicine makes it possible for somebody like Bob to be hours away or thousands of miles away from the person who's, who he's trying to help diagnose. Imagine if the frontline worker had an AI assistant in their pocket that could outline what the most likely diagnoses are and suggest a diagnostic path to actually arrive at the diagnosis and say, you need to call the diagnostician. We could probably make do with a tenth as many diagnosticians as we currently have. Or imagine that you're in a small rural clinic in the, in the labor room and on the wall there's a virtual assistant. And you can say, hey, Mal help, Malika, the patient is bleeding and the prototype which is already being tested, walks you through the emergency steps to do in that, in that situation. Now let me get fi finish with a more personal example, one that applies to academics, as I suspect most of you are. I'm currently editing an overlay journal that publishes reviews of online infectious disease preprints. And I've become very interested in the structural barriers to both publishing and accessing information, whether it's for ethnic minorities in the US or people who live in countries, especially where the first language is not English, or even countries where, which speak English but don't speak it exactly the way it's spoken in London or in Manhattan. So we might wish for a world in which a scientific paper written by a non-English speaker was evaluated just on the basis of the science and not on the basis of the language, but that's not gonna happen in my lifetime. But now everybody has a copy editor in their pocket because most of my students are not native English speakers and they used to pay for expensive professional copy editing or they used to publish in their national language and national journals. Now they send me manuscripts that look like they've been written by the one, somebody who works for The Economist. Um, Google Translate was pretty good, but now you can put a translation into GPT and ask it to do a translation in the style of a scientific manuscript or in the style of a presentation or, like I did last night, in a more casual style of a presentation, or, <laughs> or in Spanish, <laughs> or in Spanish using Mexican idioms. And who, to whom does those benefits accrue? They accrue not to the people who are sitting on top of the global health pyramid in Berkeley, California. They accrue to people for whom who are seeking information that is not in their native tongue, or who are trying to communicate in a language that is not their native tongue, and that will improve global health equity. Thank you. So the way this works is that each of the debaters will get a five minute rebuttal period. When they're done, we're gonna open it up to all of you. Get your opinions. You can query each of these individuals uh, and uh, we'll move forward from that point onward. So, uh, on to the rebuttals. Dr. Flexman. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I um, really appreciate a lot of the points that we just heard from Steph. And I feel like our debate is not about whether this tech is good or bad. What I really want to convince you of is that this stuff is dangerous. And so I want you to know from the start that I am very excited about the prospects of the current generative AI systems. Whatever is coming next when GPT-5 debuts this fall or could we hope sooner? Uh, and the future that might be coming for our kids, for their kids from this stuff. And on the other hand, you know, Optimism is great, but we have to be cautious as well. 
And when I, I think about the caution, and what I really want you to get out of this, is that all of these promises come with this risk of AI bias. And there are things that we can be doing now to mitigate this bias. Self-driving cars is an amazing example. It turns out that the people originally hyping self-driving cars were about 10 years ahead of what they could actually do. And so that means I've been excited about self-driving cars for about 10 years because they were claiming that they would be this revolution in reducing uh, road traffic injuries way before they had that potential. But California just said that Waymo can have driverless taxis go on the highway. I thought I might be able to take a driverless taxi from the airport to this hotel. Not yet, but I signed up so that they'll tell me when I am able to. <laughs> but we need these taxis to be safe. And actually, there's a very interesting thing happening at Waymo, specifically around making these safe, where they have a simulation, and they have real cars driving, real passengers. They also have real cars driving just for learning, with an employee kind of in there trying to pay enough attention so that they can hit the brakes if they need to. And then they have a virtual car, virtually driving, around in a virtual world that they've open sourced so we can see what they've put in there. Uh, you know, I haven't quite figured out how it works yet, but I would love to see do they have people in wheelchairs crossing the street in this virtual world to make sure their virtual cars don't virtually run them over? Uh, are there other ways that they can make sure that you know their AI can detect people who have different color skin, have different gaits, or ways of walking, different behaviors that are more or less predictable when they're engaging with road traffic? And so, like I said, let's be optimistic. There's a lot of potential from all of this, but let's go in eyes wide open about what some of the threats and risks are. Um, I've got so many movie ideas since we're so close to Hollywood talking about this, and movies have been really good in imagining what potential futures can be. Did anyone see Prometheus? It's like uh, one of the Alien series, and I, I'm not sure if enough people watched it to make a big story about it, but I saw a few nods. So I'll go on just to say that in this prequel to the Alien space series, there is a space mission that has this amazing AI doctor. It's uh, basically an autonomous surgery unit. And the main character, how much can I tell you and not spoil the movie for you? There's gender bias in the AI doctor. See the movie if you want to know more. <laughs> um, but, but I want to also tag on to how amazing these large language models are. The way ChatGPT can do writing, it's going to be a huge breakthrough for our students and colleagues who are not native English speakers. It'll be a breakthrough for the ones who are native English speakers and don't like writing that much because you can give it a bullet point list of things in English, not in English, whatever, and say from that, give me a rough draft. And there are huge questions coming back to some of these issues about the uh, novice to expert progression and its apprentice gap that I'm worried about in this. But I think there's huge potential there as well. So do not think I'm saying we shouldn't use AI. I really appreciated the idea of Steph preparing for this debate with an AI tutor, training him in the debating, because I was imagining how, and you know, to make it kind of a Rocky III version of prepping for the big fight, I should be like on the beach trying to convince pigeons, convince pigeons of my position and talking to them with pebbles in my mouth in a low tech uh, sort of an uh, approach while Steph is on a space shuttle training with uh, GPT-7. But in fact, I used AI also to prepare for this. It's a great way to summarize ideas, to think things through. Uh, and um, I think that the only thing I want to add beyond all of that is um, the concern about the lack of access to these things which is one of those kind of like unintended consequences threats that I didn't get to really elaborate on in my opening statement because you need to pay $20 a month to get the cutting edge model of your choice. I think I'm paying for three of them right now. Um, and you need to know that there's a big difference between the chat GPT that you can get for free, allegedly, just by giving them your name and information and all of your data, and the version that you can get for $20 a month. And I think that a lot of people right now might 
just be getting the version that you can get without cost and not benefiting as much as the version that you can get for $20 a month. And looking forward as these things progress, I think we have to be worried about how that might spread uh, inequities as well. Thanks. I think we're seeing more convergence than is allowed in a debate. <laughs> so I agree with AB again. Um, and of course, I agree there are all kinds of things that are wrong with AI tools. And the video that he showed from Joy, I actually showed in my class. <laughs> um, and I love it. Um, there are all kinds of things that are wrong with today's AI tools, and they have inbuilt biases because they've been trained on white populations, and they've been trained on current practices which reflect the inequitable practices that are the current practices. And that doesn't mean that AI on balance is bad for people who are not white or live in the United States, in part because the biology of people is overall a lot more similar across racial and ethnic groups, in fact, virtually the same, than the things that make it different. So the example of facial recognition is a really good one of showing extreme bias. It turns out that's not universally the case for most of biology. And the question for me is, what's our alternative, right? If, if we want to say AI for nobody, that's impossible, at least I think we all agree with that. Do we say the AI should only be used on the populations on which it was trained um, because it's not as good for other populations? Well, that's sort of like saying that the Los Angeles schools do a better job for students who are white, and therefore Los Angeles schools should only be made available to white children. I mean, it just seems crazy. It seems that what you do is you recognize those biases and you use that to both fix the AI and as a window into fixing the underlying biases that cause the AI to be biased in the first place. Avi didn't mention one thing that I really expected him to mention, although he did kind of implicitly, so I'm gonna mention it for him. <laughs> And that is, it really worries me that the AI is entirely in the hands of the private sector, right? Um, they tend to prioritize profit over protecting populations, and even more so when it's a global competition, right? And some of the actors are not the most savory. And I agree with him. I mean, if he'd said that, I would agree with him. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned Elon Musk before. How crazy is it that one man who owns a company is able to decide whether the military in Ukraine gets access to telecommunications capabilities? I mean, if that isn't insane, I don't know what is. So I happen to think that there are some good things about capitalism, but only if it's properly regulated and controlled and monitored, especially when you've got monopolistic situations like Skylink. And so what worries me is that we have globally become impotent at regulating the private sector, and frankly, to a large degree, because we've become impotent in this country and we have a, a habit of imposing our will on much of the rest of the world. Just look at what's happening to the pandemic accord in Geneva because we refuse to go along with any rational access to AI in the case of a pandemic where we need access to life-saving products. So my response is that we can't shut it down. We shouldn't shut it down. The benefits for the global populations are too great. But we do need to get our act together and figure out how to better regulate it and monitor it. Now, we're not the regulators, but we are the people who can do the monitoring and bring to the attention of the regulators the harms that, that AB has pointed out and that many of you are probably dreaming up. Because if we don't do that, then we are gonna see some of the horrors like what's happening to our children with Facebook and everything else. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the stimulating both sides of, of the uh, resolution. I actually want to weigh in. I normally don't do this uh, as a moderator, but I was sitting uh, outside uh, having lunch, and I said, I need to get educated on this AI stuff. And so I went to a resource. I actually went to Google Gemini which is an open AI source. And I asked AI, if you want to call it that, what do you think, I, I literally typed this in, 
What do you think of the resolution that AI is a threat to global health? That's what we're debating. That's what we're voting on. And this is AI's response. Now, understand it's a little biased, <laughs> but it did have a feeling about it. And it said, I believe the resolution that AI is a threat to global health is too strong of a statement. AI offers significant potential for positive impacts alongside the risks. This is very interesting. Here's why. First of all, oversimplification of your resolution. AI is a, <laughs> AI is a vast field with many applications. While some uses might pose risks, others can be incredibly beneficial for healthcare. And I think we heard both sides of that per, uh, position. The other point AI wants to make is missed opportunities. Dismissing AI entirely could hinder advancements in disease detection, drug discovery, and resource allocation in underserved areas. Then AI sort of takes a step back and says, however, the concerns about AI and global health are very real. Here's a more balanced perspective coming from AI. <laughs> AI needs to have careful development, implementation, and regulation. That was amazing to hear AI say that. We need to be mindful of the potential biases and privacy issues when building and deploying AI tools in healthcare. Regulation and oversight are absolutely crucial. Clear guidelines are needed to ensure AI is used ethically and responsibly in the medical field. In conclusion, AI, this, this entity, is complex issue with both risk and rewards for global health. With careful development and responsible use, AI has the potential to be a powerful force for good. I actually think AI was pretty balanced, and, and it's a, it wasn't meant to dissuade any of you from your opinions. I'm sure you still have them. And I want to open it up to the mics. Uh, individuals who have an opinion uh, want to query either one of our debaters or AI up there somewhere. Uh, please come to the microphone. So, first one in the back there. Yep, that's Hi. you. Hi, Adam Levine from Brown University. Um, so I've been doing um, research for 12 years in Bangladesh with colleagues of mine at ICDDRB. Um, I originally called that machine learning research until I learned that if I called it artificial intelligence, people gave me more money and also perked up their ears at cocktail parties. And in that 12 years, I think me and my colleagues in Bangladesh um, have learned quite a few things about the benefits and also the limits of these tools, as was described here. But I did want to argue with one of the points that was made, which is that this is entirely in the hands of the private sector. My research and the research that we're doing at ICDDRB has been completely funded by the NIH and other public donors. There are, and I was recently attending uh, the NIH Fogarty International Center's network meeting for the mobile health in low and middle income countries grant that it has and met dozens and dozens of other researchers entirely publicly funded, many of whom are working on artificial intelligence or machine learning modeling for improving healthcare in low and middle income country settings. And so I think there actually are a lot of folks outside the private sector, specifically in global health, working on this, and we should try and actually encourage more of that. There are certainly ethical issues that arise, and it's our duty, as it is with all research that we conduct, to try and minimize those biases that can introduce harm to patients. There's not a single intervention that we've ever created in medicine or public health that hasn't had bad side effects. We need to be wary of those, but we also need to look at the balance of the benefits versus the harms uh, with artificial intelligence as with everything else that we do. You know, as a final point, I'll say that I, in general, am not an optimist or a pessimist about anything. The glass is not half full and the glass is not half empty. The glass is exactly twice as large as your available water supply. 
So sell your big cup, buy a slightly smaller one, and use the difference to purchase a little more water. In other words, when it comes to artificial intelligence, I think the negatives and the positives have been overhyped. That doesn't mean that it's useless. It means that we've got to figure out how to do it right and take it step by step in that direction. Yeah. <clears throat> Great comment. Uh, but I, what I want to do, I'm going to give the two debaters their chance to respond to a number of the queries and comments. But let's try, you know, always watching the clock, let's start over here and then we'll go to, over to Peter and then the middle. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark Smolensky from Ending Pandemics. Um, this just reminds me of when I started my field and I was in, thrown into the whole dual use phenomenon uh, about bioterrorism and the danger and threat it was going to be. And so I think the problem I have with your preposition is that you said it's a threat to global health. No one's going to argue that there are dangers to AI, but you made it so non, you know, uh, you know that it's, it reminded me of the conversations of decolonization and global health. What we have here now is we have a technology that's being used by the global north, if you will, that everybody's worried about the inequalities in the global south. I guarantee you, the global south is going to show us how AI is going to transform global health before we realize its own potential because we're too afraid to empower people in countries to reduce those biases and use this technology to leapfrog and advance global health. And I dare say that that's what we'll be hearing at CUGHs in the future is the Global South showing us how AI has made a difference in reducing equalities. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I'm going to go over, I'm going to jump around, Peter, and then in the middle. Thanks, Peter Kilmarks from the Fogarty International Center. I'm an enthusiastic user of, of AI. Maybe I should see if NIH will pay for my upgrade from to ChatGPT4. <laughs> the, uh, the debate is a great format. I, I'm the moderator for a debate every year in the interest HIV meeting. And for this year, I asked ChatGPT to recommend 10 topics for the great debate, and then I said, now make them more controversial, and now I said, now make them uh, in the format of a question, and it responded quite well. It's been said that if uh, AI will not take your job, but someone who knows how to use AI will take your job. So as, as Steph Bertosi said, instead of 10 diagnosticians, there's only going to be two di diagnosticians. So we should all be learning how to use AI. So we're one of those two and not the eight that have lost their jobs. Um, Tom, I'd like to ask you to ask for a show of hands of how many people are actually using AI. And maybe we can break that down by LMIC versus HIC and career stage and all those things. But uh, I, I'd be interested in that. Um, but I'd like to ask Dr. Flaxman if he used AI to generate his list of threats to AI, which I'm expecting it, it, it probably is. You know, first I developed them myself. Then I went to ask AI to refine my presentation of them. But before I had got to actually telling it what they were, it had said, that's a great idea to ask me for help refining your points. Here are some points I think you should make. <laughs> And so it was pretty well aligned. I do want to frame this, though, as what philosophers have thought of as the philosophical notion of bullshit. And when people talk about hallucinations, and sometimes these machines say things that are not true, what I think of is this 1980s inquiry into BS that said actually the hallmark of BS according to the philosophers, is saying things without regard to whether it's true or false. And that's exactly what these language models are doing. They're saying things just like they've seen them said. They've read the entire internet, so they've seen every way everyone says things. And so they can give you these beautifully balanced summaries of what they've seen on the internet, which might have bias. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I did certainly use AI in some of my preparation. In the middle here. Hi, I'm Yvonne Butler Toba. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And you actually just hit on my point. Um, the um, hallucinogenic uh, factors of AI. Uh, in our the American College of OB-GYN conference, 
we tried asking AI all of these, ChatGPT specifically, all of these questions that were um, related to obstetric complications and then pulled out what was true and what was not true. The problem is that AI is only as good as the information it puts that's, that you input. Um, but then it makes up stuff and sometimes what is, not sometimes, the vast majority of times, it's making up things that's already out there that's already false. Um, so I, I always wonder about whether or not um, there's, there shouldn't be a, a bit more focus on making sure that's corrected because then we're using these in places where um, the funds, the resources to correct these may not necessarily be um, uh, uh, something that's highly considered. We may get to a point of where we're doing medicine using AI on all of these wrong assumptions and wrong biases uh, with little time to have them fixed. Thank you. Over here. Okay, so um, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation about the AI. I may shift it a little bit through educational level of using it, uh, AI. It's not only for providing the service or fixing the global health problem, but also teaching global health to our students, either undergrads or postgrads. So I'll share some things that I have done recently with my students. So I, I gave a test and I divided the test into two parts, take home part and in class part. It's just two days apart. And the take home part, of course, is an open book. So I'll give an example. So I asked my students to compare single bear versus Bismarck versus uh, beverage healthcare system financing and give examples from all over the world. And all of them get the full mark in that. I repeated the same question in the ink last test two days, but saying, choose two healthcare financing models and compare them and give examples. And only one student answered this question. So the problem is there is no way to discover that this is AI generated response or like human generated response. And that's really problematic in teaching. So we started to use this internet with like hope that we will overcome many of the obstacles that we have worldwide, but it turned out that we are isolated, we are segregated, we are living the same home, but we are not with each other. Similarly here for the AI, maybe we'll use it, but we cannot guarantee that the students reach the capabilities for their knowledge, skills, and attitudes that uh, literally we can uh, measure them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. We're going to give these two a chance to respond, but I'm going to quickly, we've got three people up, it looks like, or is it four? Uh, but go ahead, Joe. Joe Buford, NYU. Yeah. Um, Tom, I, was, I loved the fact that you read what, ch what Chatbot told you to read about the question about uh, good or bad for global health, and the only, you referred many times to health care and not health, and I think that's a huge issue. <clears throat> it certainly reflects the conversation, but the importance of clarity around terms and the issue that global health is not only healthcare, it's a lot of other things. So the second observation I wanted to make, and I think it's again for their, our colleagues here, is um, having sat in on a number of sessions around the use of AI in, and the private sector question, it has tended to go in the direction of personal health care services, again, because that's where the money is. And many colleagues in, in the Global South have talked about where we really need this is supply chain, where we really need this is looking at broader issues like climate change, housing, transportation, et cetera. So I just want to put those two things out for conversation um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, in the back, I don't know if there's a microphone there. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Hi, my name is Arthur. I'm from Stanford, and I'm a consultant at Google Research's AI for DR team. Um, the generalizability point, I think, is super important to make sure these models work for all populations. And I think one thing, at least in the US, if you look at which companies have received FDA approval for an AI device, they're all startups. They have relatively limited cash, and they can't purchase data sets from 100 different ethnic populations around the world to ensure that they generalize well. So 
My question is, how do we as the global health community form collaborations to make sure that the data sets that the models are trained on are as diverse as possible? Because without that, they are probably going to miss things in certain populations. And an example is just three days ago, you know, they published a paper that will get FDA approval for retinopathy of prematurity and the data sets from Stanford and India. That's not, <laughs> that's not cutting the bar for uh, diversity. And if we can get to a point where everyone shares data, we can probably build generalizable models. Great comment. Uh, we're gonna just get the last few in and then I wanna reserve the last five minutes for these two. Yes. I appreciate the wonderful discussion. I want to ask if we can change the narrative of AI is dangerous to focusing on people are dangerous. When we think about any technology that we have had in our history, we see that there is a good way to use it and there is an evil way to use it. And to the level that we cannot control people on how to utilize it, we're going to suffer. This is an amazing technology that can improve health locally and globally. It can advance all of us. But it has the potential in the wrong hands to make us suffer. And I think part of the discussion needs to be, what do we need to do about people harming each other? Whether it's through AI or other ways that we have seen we have the potential to harm. Thank you. Thank you. Next. So uh, like yeah. her, I, I also worry about the misuses that are intentional because I, I worry about the threat to democracy worldwide because of AI. But let's say that you can control for that through regulation and laws. The other huge worry I have, and this came up at a session this morning about the triple threat to the environment and we concurrently talked about AI, is I don't know how you would uh, control for the environmental impact that AI has uh, because there's currently this arms race to build more data centers, more processing centers. Um, I looked up the Sloan Management Review says this could be one of the biggest contributors to the carbon <coughs> footprint in the world by building more data centers and I think that that would disproportionately affect your low and middle income countries because of the, the, the kind of arms race to build more data capacity to make AI work and so I'd like to hear y'all's kind of thoughts on how we could control for that. Thank you. And the last comment. <laughs> Thank you. I came here from Mexico where the ASU president uh, joked that the only area with slower innovation than education was religion. And uh, that reminded me of how I think about religion. Religion is fine as long as you have your religion, but it gets dangerous when the religion has you. And in some sense, it might be the same with AI. You know, I will be very helpful as long as we have the AI, but the AI doesn't have us. And also resonate with the final point here, obviously data consumption, energy consumption will be an interesting challenge to tackle as well. Thank you all very much for your comments. I'm gonna turn to our esteemed colleagues here, uh, if they would like to respond to any of those, and then we're gonna vote. Wow, amazing, amazing contributions from all of you. I can't respond to every single one of them. I would love to. Um, and I want to start where we ended, which was about this risk of the environmental impact of these technologies, because I'm really glad that we brought it into the conversation. Um, because yeah, and, and to pile on, besides the energy that it takes to run these AIs and train them. It also takes resources to make the chips that we're using to run these. And what about you know the rare elements that have to go into making them, some of which come from uh, some of the war-turn and vulnerable parts of the world. And it also requires human labor to do this training. There's like basically all the words on the internet plus one weird trick to make our chatbots of today. And that weird trick 
is reinforcement learning from human feedback. And the humans who do it are often low wage workers, sometimes in very vulnerable situations that have to go through labeling some of the most horrible content on the internet to make the chatbots not share that with the rest of us. To quickly <laughs> jump through some of the other amazing things that were brought up during this, uh, one early on that I want to go back to is the comments from Brown University about open models versus closed models, because there's a vigorous debate going on right now about whether it's better to keep some of these powerful models closed, because then the companies that control them can put safeguards and uh, guardrails on them, or whether it's better to have them open, because then we can understand what's happening with them. And I, I don't know what the answer is with that. I just want you to know that there is a, a very important debate right now about whether, for example, it should be allowed to have frontier models, is one of the terms of art you'll hear, these uh, really cutting edge models available openly. Um, and that gets into regulation, which came up in a lot of these conversations. Again, I, I think this is one that I just want to call your attention to because we don't know how to do it. We don't know how it's going to play out. But you know, uh, one of the comments made me think of these safety monitoring boards when you are trying out a new health intervention that looks for any of the harms and keeps an eye on it and can say, yo, you've got to stop. This is actually doing harm. Maybe there are some unique aspects of global health research that can help with the regulation and AI safety. And I'm going to I'm going to wrap up after one more, although I want to keep going for so much. But this comment about the hallucinations and the basically false information coming out when you're asking for diagnoses in OBGYN, um, I think that there's two ways that people are thinking about it. And I want you to know that there are some people who think that this can be solved. Bill Gates wrote he thinks this can be solved. And so maybe GPT-5 is going to spend a lot of effort trying to figure out if the thing it says is true and not say it if it's not true. Uh, you know, shout out to the Google researcher who asked a question. I think Gemini is actually pretty good at saying, I, I just don't know how to answer that. Sorry. Um, but I think it's going to be right about like math. Like either we'll give you the correct a solution to your equation or say, I don't know how to do that. But I don't think it's going to be right about the obscure questions that come up in the long tail of questions about global health. So the other way of thinking about it is the one I proposed, which is that everything this says is BS. It's just saying it because it sounds good. And that still could be useful. We just have to know that it said it because it sounded like the kinds of things it's seen people say. Uh, you have to figure out whether it's uh, something you can put your faith in. And I, I kind of want to close with this really, I think, deep observation about technologies in general that I think is particularly relevant here, throws back to this question about how maybe we should think about humans more. And uh, it is that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral, which to me means it's all about the context. Uh, I'll leave it there for now. Step. So Abe is the real expert. I'm just an enthusiastic user. Um, so I'll just say one thing, and that's we don't have time to talk about it today, but I love the point that was brought up about education. This is a consortium of universities in global health, and maybe next year we should really think about what this means for our educational mission. Because I'm really struggling. My course last fall, I teach a big introductory course. I enrolled GPT in the course, and it did better than oh, probably 85% of my students. Um, it, you know, it got a 100% on the exam, on the midterm. It did really well on the op-ed, way better than most of my students. Um, and at the same time, I'm incredibly excited about the potential of this generative AI for education. I have a third monitor, which is my AI monitor, and I used to do quite a bit of coding in Excel when I was younger, and I use it a lot. Now I code all the time because GPT codes with me. And it's so much fun because it doesn't just code for me, it teaches me how to code better. It introduces me, I mean, it's incredible how much fun it is to learn with it if you do it right. And it's incredible how stupid it makes you if you just let it think for you, right? And we haven't got a clue yet, I don't have a clue yet, how to bring it into my classes in a way that gets people to be excited about using it and doesn't make them stupid. And uh, so I, I, I think it would be a great topic for next year. Thanks for that very much. <laughs> Thank
brings us to the end of this uh, particular session. But before we do, Peter asked how many of you, like Steph just said, uh, are actively using AI in your daily work? Raise your hand. Uh, all right. It, it's almost unanimous. <laughs> okay. The next step is we have that resolution that it is a, AI is a threat to global health, uh, and we had a vote on that in the beginning. Uh, I'd like to re-query the, the group to see if your consensus has changed any. Having hear, heard all the comments from the group as well as our colleagues, so all those in favor of the resolution that it is a threat, raise your hand. I actually think there's more <laughs> raising their hand. <laughs> I actually think it has swayed uh, the audience here. How many uh, do not feel it's a threat at all? I think it's an ambiguous statement in response. We all see the positive attributes. We're also cognizant of what needs to be put in place to keep it uh, from becoming threats uh, to our work in the field of global health, not just health care, but global health. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you to our debaters.